everybody again it's uh, Eric Simpson nice to see you the sun is shining today blue skies and just want to thank the Lord for another beautiful beautiful day I hope you're able to enjoy these days it has been an amazing the, the, the number of uh, days together that we've that we've had with with the sunshine and that will make it make the lockdown a bit easier uh, the lockdown is not going to last forever uh, it'll probably be some number of weeks yet before we'll be able to meet together as a church we are listening to the government and the guidance and certainly we want to be able to go along with what the government is asking us to do and so just hang in there I want to encourage you to read your bible to listen to some good music to connect up with other believers have some time on the phone on uh, facebook chat whatever it is that that you can do to encourage yourself today we are going to uh, keep on with our study into mark we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 2 from verse 18 uh, through chapter 3, verse 6. I want us to consider the idea, the, con the, the, the idea, the concept of Christianity getting it right. Now, I realize that's a big, big, uh, a big, big phrase, a big, big statement, but hopefully it will sort of kind of come together as we work through it. We, were going to be, we will be uh, looking at the scripture. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll dive right in. Thank you, Father, for today, for the sunshine. We pray that you would encourage every believer who is listening to me right now. For If there are those uh, who are still struggling with this whole Christianity thing but have sort of tuned in and, and are watching, I want to thank you for them. And I pray that you would encourage them, you, you bless them, and uh, that this might be able to put some perspective on what this Christianity thing is all about and some of the struggles and some of the battles. Thank you, Father. We pray that you'd help me to say the words that Jesus would say of this, as if he was here in this place right now. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I do believe that many people are turned off to Christianity. And truth be told, I think it's a lot because of what we've made it to be. And if you look throughout, uh, throughout the New Testament, certainly we see lots of issues, lots of things that need to be dealt with. Um, and one of the things that I want to throw out, we're going to sort of connect this concept in to what we're going to be reading, is that of tradition. Tradition. Now, if anyone knows me, you'll know I'm not necessarily a, a traditionalist. I, I, the things that we do, I want to make sure that we do them on purpose, and that there's a reason that we do the things, and that they provide meaning and they provide value to all that we do. But what do you think of when you hear the word tradition? Boring? Tired? Stability? old, comforting, maybe some of those, maybe others. But, you know, as there are with most things, there are two sides of the coin. And there's two sides of the, of the tradition coin as well. You know, we can hold on to traditions just because we've always done it a certain way, but there's no real value to this particular thing. Or we can have traditions and times that provide richness and stability and strength to things that we do and things that we are involved with. Um, you know, I think about my own uh, family traditions. You know, so many um, um, memories and things. I remember traveling to my aunt's uh, at Christmas time as a child growing up, and just one of those things I can still imagine myself in the car and in, the, in that back seat sat next to my uh, my two brothers and my sister and on that trip of a hundred miles it seemed like a thousand miles uh, through the little towns and the areas uh, up up the roads to where they lived and the next state up and uh, that's a that's an incredible family tradition that we have and sometimes we have these traditions that are good and that they provide real value but sometimes we have traditions that um, are there, as we said, just because um, we've always done it that way and they just don't provide a real purpose. We're going to be looking into this, into the scripture, but before we do, let me throw out a little story here that I think is kind of funny. 
says this, a very poor uh, holy man lived in a remote part of China. Every day before his time of meditation, in order to, to show his devotion, he put a dish of butter up on the windowsill as an offering to his God, since food in that area was so scarce. One day, his cat came in and ate the butter. To remedy this, he began tying the cat to the bedpost each day before the quiet time. This man was so revered for his piety that others joined him as disciples and worshipped as he did. Generations later, long after the holy man had died, his followers still placed an offering of butter on the windowsill during the time of prayer and medication. And furthermore, each one brought a cat and tied it to the bedpost. They don't know why, but they just did, just because that's what was always done tradition. Today we want to see three isolated, but I believe linked events that are going to challenge us to ask ourselves the question, are we getting it right? Are we getting it right? Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to dive in. Thank you, Father, for this time and today. We thank you for the sunshine that's out here. Father, we pray that you would encourage each person who's watching, who's watching regardless of what uh, time of day or night it is, and we ask that you would both bless and challenge them as we look at this portion of, uh, of us as believers and as maybe uh, people who are not believers and are sort of considering all this. Uh, we pray that you would teach us and challenge us so that this hour, this 45 minutes that we are together, uh, even though it's online, could be a value and that you could change something within us. Thank you, Father, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So two words we want to understand before we get into actual reading of the text. The first one is that of fasting. Now you may have heard of this word. It may not be totally new to you, but let's let's kind of talk about it for just a moment to make sure we are on the same page. That of fasting. It's an on-purpose time of no food, sometimes no water, in order to focus on the spiritual side of life. Very common amongst the Jews, certainly throughout the Old Testament, into the New Testament, and certainly cultures in the East. Um, it has, uh, the idea of fasting is, is in the New Testament, is in the Bible, and has come into, the, is into the church, and, and there, are, there, are, there are many believers who do practice this spiritual discipline of fasting. Jesus did not have a problem with fasting at all. In Luke chapter 18, verse 12, it speaks about the story of the two people. One was a, one was a, a, a Pharisee, uh, the other was a uh, w w was a man, and uh, the Pharisee said, uh, "Look, God, I, I, I fast twice a week. I give ten percent of, of all the money that I have to the poor, and look how good of he didn't say this, but look how good of a person I am." And that's the way he viewed himself because of the things that he did of this fasting. But it says that the other man beat himself on the breast and said, "I have, I am, I, I, I'm a sinner. I've done terrible things, and God, would you please forgive me?" And that is in essence, in essence what he said. And Jesus said, that man went away just, uh, justified right with God as opposed to the Pharisees. Jesus did not have a problem with fasting if done in the right way. However, this Pharisee, particularly in Luke chapter 18, what we just got done mentioning, was all about his, his appearance of looking spiritual. And that's the reason that he did it. That of fasting. The second word is that is a Sabbath, a time set aside from the busyness of life to focus again on the spiritual side of life, the spiritual side of yourself, to focus on God, a time of rest for the body. This actually goes back to the time of creation. It doesn't, the Bible does not call it a Sabbath, but it's a ceasing of work. And that's actually the root of the word Sabbath, a ceasing of work. God, uh, throughout the days of creation, he ceased from the work that he did. It's not that God got tired, but he did it as an example to us. So that of fasting and that of the Sabbath. So let's now read all of the scripture from uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 18 
through chapter 3, verse 6, we're going, to we're going to see three separate snippets, three separate brief stories, and we're going to try and tie all these together. We weren't, we're not going to go through them, but we're going to pick uh, individual bits from them and see how they are tied together as we look toward trying to get this Christianity thing right. It says this, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Interesting how... John's disciples were tied with the Pharisees. Now, we're not going to get into that, but that would be an interesting study to take a look at that. Some of the people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going in through the uh, grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The disciples said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Chapter 3, verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What an amazing sequence of events. We're going to quickly look at, first of all, Jesus versus the Pharisees. We're going to take all these, put them in a pot, mix them up, and see how the Pharisees compare with Jesus on some very important things. First of all, the Pharisees were more bothered about appearance than substance. They were all about appearing spiritual. We talked about that bit in Luke chapter 18, how that this Pharisee was so proud of himself that he had fasted twice a week and that he gave a 10%, he gave a tithe of all that he had. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 5, Jesus speaks about praying and he says, listen, don't be like these lot who go out on the street corner, and I realize, you know, we don't have that problem today. He said, don't be like these lot who go out on the street corner and make a big deal about their prayers. And they say all these words, all these repetitions, and, and, uh, and uh, he says they, they want to appear spiritual, they want to appear to, that, that, that they're really connected to God, but all these words that they say, all these fancy words, and all the volume of things that they're saying, he says they've received their reward already. Don't be like them, he said, because the Pharisees were more bothered about appearance and substance. But secondly, they set themselves up as the standard, and they expected others to do what they did. They came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, um, they said, uh, the disciple, our disciples uh, uh, fast, the disciples of John fast, but your disciples don't fast. Why is that? Why is that? So they, were, they set themselves up as the, the go-to place, as the standard of what is meant to happen 
or not happen. That is how they need themselves. But also, also thirdly, they were always looking for an opportunity to criticize. They were looking for an opportunity to criticize Jesus at every step. Um, they, uh, both in the second and the third account, they said, uh, what are you doing on the Sabbath, picking that grain? What are you doing on the Sabbath of healing that man? Now, did you stop and think? That, wait a minute, they didn't think about and have compassion that here were some hungry people. Here are some people that needed some food. And, you know, and, and I'm so thankful that today during this time of this coronavirus, I'm so glad that, 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 there are, that there are people, that there are agencies to be able to provide food for people who are hungry. But these law, these Pharisees, the only thing they thought about was that this is the, the, this, this law that, uh, that they actually were using in a wrong way. But here are some hungry people, and they are picking some grain uh, on, the, on the Sabbath, and they're eating the grain. And they're nitpicking the fact that they're doing that, viewing that as work uh, on the Sabbath because they were hungry. But then here is this man who had a, a withered hand, a, a defective hand, and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. Not only didn't they have any compassion on the hungry, but they didn't have any compassion on those who needed healing. And there is Jesus and healed that man on the Sabbath. Instead of wanting to raise their own game, they wanted to pull Jesus down. And this is the part that absolutely blows my mind. You stop and think about it for just a moment. There it is, in the synagogue. Jesus is there. There's that man with the withered hand. And Jesus said to the man, he said, stand up in front of everyone. And, he, and, and then Jesus said this to challenge these, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the Pharisees about uh, what, what is right to do, uh, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to, to do evil, to, get, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. We're going to come to this in just a moment. But he looked at them in anger, and then he healed the man. But they didn't see the healing with a heart of compassion. They, they, they weren't happy that a man got healed. They were all about whether Jesus was doing work on the Sabbath. And they had gotten what God meant to be good. God had designed the Sabbath to be a time that they could focus on Him, a time to rest from their work, a time to be able to focus on the spiritual side of life, but they turned it, all, all, turned it upside down and to make it a thing like a whipping post. And Jesus said, no, 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 that's not what it's all about. And we're going to come to it in just a moment that when Jesus said that, you know what, uh, the Sabbath was uh, made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And what does that mean? He was saying this, that, uh, that the, the Sabbath was not meant to be such a strict idea that if someone needed help, that we weren't meant to help them. That was not the point. But the Pharisees got that all wrong, all mixed up. Let's take a quick look and think about Jesus now. As we said, the Pharisees were more bothered about appearance than substance. On the contrary wise, Jesus was more bothered about substance than appearance. The Pharisees earlier had said that Jesus speaks with authority. Jesus tells us straight. He, uh, when, when, when someone needed a telling off, and often those Pharisees needed a telling off, he would tell them off. He speaks the truth, and he's got the credentials to prove it. Born of a virgin, according to the prophecy in the Bible. We already seen uh, last week or two weeks ago how that Jesus knew the hearts of the people. He's able to heal the bodies of people, as we've seen multiple times now in the book of Mark. And soon he is to be crucified and then resurrect from the dead. Jesus was always looking for an opportunity not to criticize and to put down, but to teach and encourage and challenge. This thing about eating and so forth uh, and, and picking grain on the Sabbath. Jesus brings in and he wants to teach these 
uh, these Pharisees something. He says, did not David, during the time that he went in to the consecrated bread, to the bread that was dedicated to the priest, and he and his companions ate from that bread? And he was not judged. He was not, he was not put down. He is Jesus saying, listen, the bread was there, yes, it's meant to, to, to serve and to, and to feed the priests, but if there are some other people there who had need of it, there's nothing wrong with it. And that's what Jesus was, was, was trying to get across to these Pharisees. Jesus was full of compassion. He fed the hungry. He healed the hurting. He was seeking the one. What a comparison, the Pharisees and Jesus. So if I had to stop right now and ask ourselves a question, which one would we be more like? Would you be like a, a Pharisee in how you deal with other Christians and uh, church and uh, people in general? Or would, would, be more, would we be more like Jesus? Which one? Let's keep that in the back of our mind as we continue on. But I want to come to just now a few glimpses into Jesus the Messiah. And these are little nuggets that are hidden throughout these three accounts that we were looking at. First of all, this thing of the wedding and the clothes and the wine in verses 18 through 22, dealing with the fasting. Jesus comes in when he's challenged about this thing of fasting. And he talks about... Uh, this, this illustration, this, this parable about a bridegroom. He says, how uh, will the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with him? Now Jesus, in this example, would be the bridegroom. And the guests would be uh, the, the men who would be with him as what we would call the best men and the groomsmen in today's lingo. And he's coming along and saying, listen, um, they uh, are, do, do they fast while the, the, the bridegroom is there? Um, they're, no, they're not going to do that as long as he is there. But then verse 20 says, The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. Now, in Bible lingo, weddings, and even today, of course, weddings are full of feasting and joy and happiness and all those kinds of ideas, just like it was in Jesus' time, whereas fasting dealt with seriousness, even dealt with sorrow. And Jesus was taking this point and saying, uh, in, 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 a, in a very interesting kind of way, he was looking toward the cross. When as he was saying, the time is going to come, the day is going to come, when the bridegroom will be taken, will be taken away, and then those, uh, those groomsmen, those uh, people of the groom, then they will fast. Then they will be in sorrow. But not now, not now. So Jesus gave quite an interesting reply to that challenge about the fasting. But then he brings in this interesting little concept about clothing about cloth and new cloth and old cloth and this thing about old wine and new wine. And he gives those two examples, and they're really two examples speaking of the same thing. He says no one takes a new piece of cloth and, 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 and sews it to an old, an old piece of clothing. Why? Because he said the new piece has not shrunk yet. Now, I remember the day when, when mom would buy me a new pair of trousers, a new pair of jeans. It did happen every now and again. And what, you, you had to try them on. I think this, this is before the days of pre-shrunk clothing. You had to try them on. Uh, and she said, well, it's going to shrink so much. And uh, sure enough, she'd throw it in the washer and bring it back out. And you'd try it on after, 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 you, after you, got it, you got it home and did all, did all that. And sure enough, that pair of trousers had shrunk. And hopefully, we got it right. And Jesus was taking this same idea. You don't take a piece of cloth that has not been pre-shunk and, and uh, sewed it onto a, a, an old garment because when it gets wet, it's going to shrink and it's going to tear. It's going to make a bigger hole yet. And likewise, you don't take new wine that is, that, that is fermenting and put it into old wineskins that have become hard uh, more brittle, the, the old leather, he says, because it's going to break as that, 
as that wine starts to ferment and create gas on the inside. And I think what Jesus is doing is saying this. He's saying, listen, I'm getting ready to do something new. I'm doing something new right now. They didn't understand it, but that's what he was driving to. But not only that, there's another second golden nugget here that Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, Jesus corrects the Pharisees' view of that of the Sabbath. He does say, remember, he said, he said uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man as a Sabbath. So the Sabbath was to serve man. The Sabbath was to provide a rest for man. The Sabbath was to provide a man, to provide man an opportunity to focus on God, to focus on the, the, the inner life, to focus on spiritual things. And it's not meant to be a slave uh, that, 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 uh, that would prevent man from doing good on the Sabbath. That was not the point. But then Jesus laid this blockbuster on him. And he says right there to the end of that in verse 28, So the Son of Man, speaking of himself, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That Sabbath, which was so important, uh, uh, particularly to the Pharisees and these law keepers, uh, the Sabbath that was so important, and it was important in the right perspective, Jesus ripped their world apart by basically saying, He Himself is Lord Master even of the Sabbath, which they held in so high esteem. And I can imagine that was really one of the things that was going on that was ripping their hearts up. And one of the reasons, as we see it very, very soon, that soon in the, in the, at uh, the end of that uh, portion in chapter 3, that they went out starting to plot on how they might kill Jesus. But a third little glimpse of Jesus and Messiah is that Jesus gets angry. Do you notice what it was at there in that last section in chapter 3, how that the Bible says that when Jesus uh, asked themselves and challenged them about this question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill life? They remained silent. They did not answer Jesus. And he saw the hardness of their heart and that social injustice, and Jesus became angry. Jesus became angry. What is it that we get angry about? Do we get angry that someone cuts us off at the roundabout? Do we get angry that the prices at the shop for a loaf of bread will go up or the price at the petrol pump is going to head up certainly at some point? Is that the sort of things we get angry about? Well, Jesus got angry about the things of the hardness of heart social injustice of the things that hurt the heart of God. But last of all, we want to think about, so what's the point? How does this relate to us today in the year 2020? You know what? <clears throat> Even though we, we may not be called Pharisees, churches and Christians can be guilty of the same sort of spirit. We can go along and we can say, well, uh, this is right, and that's wrong, and this is right, and all kinds of things. Let's just think about it for just a few moments. First of all, uh, non-negotiables are real. There are some non-negotiables. Those core beliefs uh, about, for example, the nature of the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's Word. Uh, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. He says, uh, your word is truth. God's word is true. That is a fundamental belief that we hold on to. If the Bible wasn't true, then let's get rid of it. There's no, there's no reason to, to do this whole church thing anymore. I've, I've said that ever since we got started. If the Bible is not real, if the Bible is not true, then we have no basis uh, for anything that we believe. And let's, cl uh, let's, let's close the doors. It's not worth my time. It's not worth your time. However, uh, for a number of reasons, we can get into all that, that, uh, that the Bible is true, God's word is true, and can be relied upon. So there are some non-negotiables non that are real. The core beliefs, the nature of the Bible, the nature of God. Who is God? 
the, 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 uh, what we call the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the role that each one has. Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do on the cross? That of salvation, how our sins are forgiven. That is totally by grace through faith from what Jesus did for us on the cross, apart from any works that I do. But as a Christian, I serve, I do, because of what God has done for me, not to earn God's favor, but because I am a believer. That is a fundamental, that is a core belief, that of eternity, that there is an eternity in heaven or in hell, that is a core belief. There are uh, some beliefs, core beliefs, that are non-negotiable. However, some, there are also negotiables that are real. Negotiables that are real. The kind of music that you have in church. And this can, this can create rips and, and divisions within church. We get, we get the, the group that like the, that like the hymns. And we get the group that like the Hillsong songs. And we get the group that like the, the country and western type of music. And, and the gospel type of music. And all these different sorts of things. And all, we can create all kinds of divisions. And, and there have been churches that have been split and, and divided. And all kinds of problems because the kind of music. However, are those the... Uh, are those the non-negotiable categories? I would say no. Of course that our, our music has to honor God and, and these things need to be discussed and so forth, but there are some negotiables that are real. Uh, the kind of church governing structure. And there's all different kind of categories, all different kinds of things that we could talk about, things that are negotiables, but there are some negotiables that need to be recognized. And that the problem is this. When we take a negotiable, something that good believers can disagree on, on how, what the Bible spe speaks about, on these things, uh, we can elevate a negotiable to become the status of a non-negotiable. And this is exactly what the Pharisees did. They took this idea of the Sabbath, and remember, God designed the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. They took the Sabbath and said, you are not to do anything. And, and as a matter of fact, Jesus said that, that they added so many things onto God's law and, and other portions of the Scripture, that the Pharisees and, and all these law added so many things onto God's law that God never designed, that God never wanted. And so this is what happened. They had taken a negotiable and... Uh, and uh, when David had taken the food and Jesus had taken the grain, there was nothing wrong with that. They had taken a negotiable and risen it to the status of a non-negotiable, saying that there is no case whatsoever that you are to eat uh, any grain from the temple or from God's house. There is no time whatsoever that you are to heal on the Sabbath. There's no case or no time whatsoever that you are to take any grain from a plant and eat it on the Sabbath. And that's the problem when it, become, when it changes and we elevate things from a negotiable to a non-negotiable. But then I want to throw out this other idea, this thing of personal convictions. Personal convictions. And we're going to describe a personal conviction as this. How you interpret what the Bible says or even if it has anything to say about such issues as alcohol, politics, clothing, language. We all have to be able to agree to disagree in love, is the bottom line. Now I realize there's some areas that, uh, looking back from the number of years that I, since I've been a Christian, that sometimes there's areas of, of life and some areas of uh, of Christianity certain, in certain parts of the world that have been risen uh, from an area of a personal conviction to a biblical doctrine. And I'm not sure that's good or that's healthy or that's biblical even. So we have to know what the Bible says. We have to, and when we have a personal conviction about what the Bible says, I think we have to be very careful to recognize that sometimes there are, there, there's areas of grayness in some of these things that we have to be willing to be flexible on. 
because what often happens is it drives a wedge because people then elevate these things, these personal convictions, to areas of, again, non-negotiable. And believers are driven apart and churches are destroyed because we take our personal convictions and raise them to areas of non-negotiable. But then there's also, there can be things such as personal preferences. That there's nothing really biblical, but just how we are. <laughs> For example, leisure time, how we spend our leisure time. And we're not talking about things that are immoral or unethical, but how we spend our leisure time. Pets. Even what direction uh, a loo roll comes out of a loo roll, whether over the top or from the bottom. Now, we all know the proper way is from the top, but that's okay. If I have a brother or sister in Christ who says, no, 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 I like it coming from the bottom, that's okay. That's a personal preference. But we're going to leave it with that. So how do we approach church? How do we approach other believers, others in the spirit of Christ or in the spirit of Pharisees? Do we stand strong on the non-negotiables, on the core beliefs, on the core doctrines of the Bible? Are we flexible on the negotiables? But do we love as Christ loved for all? These are things that are difficult, I agree. And when we get into the gray areas, it makes it difficult. But as I saw, as, I, as I've said to so many people, you know what, I'm very happy to sit across from a, a table and have a cup of coffee and we can talk about everything under the sun and it's okay. And I, my prayer is that uh, for, those, uh, for, for, for those of us who, are, who have uh, committed our lives to Jesus, that we will uh, endeavor, that we will work towards getting this Christianity thing right, that we will not be as the Pharisees, but, but that we will do things as best we can as Jesus did. God bless you all. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.